Our second scripture reading is Ezekiel chapter 47, verses 1 to 7 and verse 12. This is one of the Old Testament passages that is alluded to in the book of Revelation. After telling Ezekiel about the defeat of Gog, who was the last enemy of God's people in Old Testament times, God gave Ezekiel a vision of a renewed temple complex. This vision is recorded in Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48. Our reading describes the river that comes out of the temple and the trees it supports. What Ezekiel was shown is very similar to what John was shown in Revelation. After the defeat of all the enemies of God's people, John saw the holy city coming down to earth from heaven, the river of the water of life and the tree of life growing on its banks were also seen by John. Robert will read God's word. Ezekiel 47. The man brought me back from the entrance of the temple, and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple towards the east. For the temple faced east, the water was coming down from the, under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me round the outside of the outer gate facing east and the water was trickling from the south side. As the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits and then led me through water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross, because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in. A river that no one could cross, he asked, he asked me, Son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the banks of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. Jumping to verse 12. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit, because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food, and their leaves for healing. Ending at verse 12. Amen. And we thank God for his holy, inspired and inerrant word. And we pray that he will write its eternal truth upon all our hearts. This is the part of the service where we would normally have our offering. So I want to encourage you to continue to put your offering in your envelope each week. And when we're able to meet together again, you can bring those offerings. We come now before God's throne of grace with prayers uh, of intercession as we pray for others and pray for ourselves, particularly thinking about how we can't have our General Assembly this week and what measures need to be put in place to deal with things. So let us come before God's throne of grace. Let us pray. God of the Church, you know that this week would normally be the annual General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. But in your sovereignty, the threat to public health due to the coronavirus means this cannot take place. We praise you that Jesus is still the sole king and head of the church. We bless you that all things were created by him and for him. Thank you we can be sure that Jesus calmly reigns in heaven in the face of this pandemic. We praise you that his kingdom does not falter and cannot fail. We bless you that Jesus holds all things together even when they feel like they're falling apart. Thank you that he is the glorious firstborn from among the dead, who has the supremacy in everything. Loving Father, we pray that you will grant your wisdom and grace to our incoming moderator, the Reverend David Bruce. Also bless his wife Zoe and their family as they support David in this new role. May the Reverend Bruce's installation on Monday night be a special occasion for him, even though it is conducted in unusual circumstances. Help David as he responds to invitations to represent PCI's views on a wide variety of issues in the media this week. Guide our press officer, Mark Smith, as he prepares press releases 
and offers advice to those asked to comment on behalf of the church. Thank you for the ministry of our outgoing moderator, the Reverend William Henry. Enable him to settle back into serving you in the congregations of Mays and Ballanderry in very different circumstances to when he left them last June. Almighty God, we ask you to undertake for our clerk, the Reverend Trevor Gribbon, and our deputy clerk, the Reverend Jim Stothers, as they prepare for meetings of the Standing Commission of the General Assembly on Tuesday and Wednesday. Guide this commission in all it does in determining ways forward on some essential items of business and direct it as it considers how our denomination can work best during the current restrictions. Give clarity to conveners of councils and committees who will be speaking to reports and presenting their work for decision. Ensure that all decisions which are taken honour you and assist the church in fulfilling its calling to the world. All sufficient one, Bless those who are responsible for managing the finances of our church, including treasurers and congregations, and PCI's financial secretary, Clive Knox, as well as the committees he supports. We pray that the work of our denomination would not be curtailed during the current crisis due to a lack of finance. We bring before you our global mission workers and our global mission partner churches, who would have sent delegates to our General Assembly. Even though we cannot meet together to hear about how you are working in various parts of the world, we ask you to increase our sense of fellowship and belonging across the Presbyterian family. God of grace, thank you for those who use the gifts you have blessed them with to produce online services for our congregations as well as the CDs and DVDs of these services, so that we can continue to worship you even though we can't physically meet together. We also praise you for those who distribute the CDs and DVDs. Compassionate God, we ask you to comfort those members of our church family who have been bereaved in recent days. Surround them with your love, and enable them to look to you for strength to meet the days ahead in your will. We bring before you those who are ill at this time, whether they're in hospital, care home, or their own home. We also pray for those who are living with long-term conditions. Thank you that we can be sure you have the power to heal. We pray that you will do this, if it is your will. We praise you that your perfect will is always good. So help us to trust in you in all circumstances. Sovereign Lord, when we turn to your word in a few moments, enable us to listen, to understand and to obey what you're saying to us through it. In Jesus' merciful and mighty name we pray. Amen. Our third hymn is Be Thou My Vision. This hymn encourages us to rely on God for protection during the spiritual conflict that every genuine believer experiences. And it encourages us to keep God at the very centre of our life when we're surrounded by all sorts of temptations in the society that we live in.
two chapters of the Bible speak about the perfection that existed in the original creation. And the last two chapters of the Bible speak about the perfection that will exist in the new creation. All the chapters in between describe how God works out his plan to ensure that his chosen people will live with him in that new creation. We studied Genesis to learn how the original creation came into being, what happened to it, and how God set in motion his rescue plan. We have studied Revelation to learn how God will bring this plan to completion. So Genesis and Revelation are two of the most important books in helping us to understand why we and the world we live in are the way we are. They also enable us to see why God's plan of salvation is so essential. Since the book of Revelation deals with the events between Jesus' ascension and his return, it helps us make sense of what has taken place in the past. It enables us to cope with the challenges associated with living for God in the present. And it prepares us for what lies ahead in the future. Winston Churchill once described the Soviet Union as a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. Many Christians consider the book of Revelation to be something similar. They ask, how are we meant to understand a book that has so much strange imagery? A lamb with seven eyes and seven horns, locusts with the appearance of horses, a woman clothed with the sun, a great red dragon, and a multi-headed beast. At the very start of our study of Revelation last September, I said that I hoped at least some of you were excited to learn more from a book you'd already studied. But I guess that others of you may be anxious because you'd read Revelation or heard sermons on it and you thought it was difficult to understand. Understanding the book of Revelation does take some effort, but I hope you've seen this effort has been worthwhile as we have learned more about God and about what he has done, what he is doing and what he will do. It takes effort to understand Revelation for two main reasons. Firstly, it contains pictures that need to be interpreted. Secondly, it frequently alludes to passages in the Old Testament which means we need to have a good grasp of the Old Testament to understand these allusions. While it's easy to get lost in the details of Revelation, its main theme is clear. It's about the victory of Jesus Christ and how that victory is relevant for Christians who were suffering when it was first written and for Christians who are suffering now. So Revelation is intended to encourage us to remain faithful to the end, even if this means death. John specifically and repeatedly identifies his book as a prophecy. This means we need to approach Revelation in the same way we approach the other prophetic books in the Bible. The Old Testament prophetic books were given to a specific people in specific historical contexts. Many of them deal with forthcoming judgment on God's people or the nations that oppressed God's people. These books also contain glimpses of future restoration after those judgments had taken place. John's prophecy is addressed to specific people in a specific historical context, namely the seven churches in the province of Asia. Furthermore, throughout this prophecy, John warns us about forthcoming judgments. And after these warnings about judgment, John speaks of a glorious new heaven and earth in which sin and death are no more. So here's a quick reminder of what we saw in the different sections of Revelation. John introduces his book as follows. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, what must soon take place. Revelation contains what God revealed to Jesus about what would take place so that Jesus could let his servants know what's coming. This means God intends us to understand what's written in the book of Revelation. 
John sets out this prophetic book in the form of a letter, using the same kind of opening that Paul uses in many of his letters. The main body of Revelation begins with John's vision of the exalted Christ and his letters to the seven churches. In this section, John receives a commission similar to that of the Old Testament prophets, and the vision he has of Jesus uses pictures from several Old Testament passages. Jesus gave John messages for seven churches in Asia Minor, which is in modern-day Turkey. The way these letters are written, let us know that while they had specific relevance to the situation faced by the seven churches in Asia Minor, God also intended them to be read by believers in every place and in every period throughout history. In the seven letters, Christ calls Christians to overcome temptations to become involved in idolatry and immorality and to faithfully endure suffering and persecution, even if this leads to death. In Revelation chapters 4 and 5, John sees a glorious vision of heaven and the worship of Jesus by the heavenly hosts. The similarity between this vision and what we read in Daniel chapter 7 indicates that it's the fulfilment of Daniel's prophecy. John's vision depicts the reign of Jesus Christ, which according to Daniel began at Jesus' ascension. The vision of heaven's throne room in Revelation chapters 4 and 5, which includes the Lamb being identified as the only one who is worthy, to open the seals of the scroll that contain God's complete and perfect plans for the future of the universe sets the stage for the judgments which are prophesied in the following chapters. Beginning in chapter 6, we have a series of judgments associated with the opening of the seals on that scroll. The judgments connected to the first four seals use imagery taken from Zechariah chapters 1 and 6, to describe the same judgments Jesus outlined in Mark chapter 13. The opening of the fifth seal reveals those who have been martyred for the sake of Christ, crying out for justice. The breaking of the sixth seal results in universal destruction that's described using pictures which are similar to those employed by the Old Testament prophets to describe the judgments of God which occurred in their day. The opening of the seventh seal is interrupted briefly by what we're told in chapter 7. Here we read that John saw a vision in which God marks his people in order to protect them from judgment. John also saw a vision of an innumerable multitude worshipping before the throne of God. Both of these visions represent the church triumphant which God has gathered from all nations. The opening of the seventh seal prepares us for the sounding of the seven trumpets. The judgments associated with the first four trumpets are similar to the judgments associated with the plagues that God sent upon Egypt in Moses' time. Trumpets five and six use terrifying pictures to warn us about how Satan destroys those who choose to follow him. There's an interlude between the sounding of the sixth and seventh trumpet. In chapter 10, John describes his vision of a mighty angel with a scroll that he's commanded to eat. This vision is similar to the one in Ezekiel chapters 2 and 3, and it indicates that the final period of history has arrived. Then in Revelation chapter 11, John is told to measure the temple of God, which symbolizes the people of God. And John describes the ministry of two witnesses who represent the church. While the sounding of the seventh trumpet, we have then declared the kingdoms of the world have become the kingdom of Christ. It would appear that God inspired John to place this central truth that we read earlier in the very centre of Revelation. In chapter 12, John has a vision that uses prophetic, prophetic language to picture the long-running conflict between Satan, who is depicted as a dragon, and the seed of the woman, who is Jesus. Then in chapter 13, John sees Satan summon assistance in his war against Christ's people. John describes a seven-headed beast arising from the sea. 
This beast represents Satan's power to persecute God's people through evil world authorities. A second beast, which is also known as the false prophet, arises from the earth and represents Satan's power to mislead people through all sorts of false religion, including false manifestations of Christianity. In chapter 14, John sees the Lamb and his people standing on Mount Zion, which symbolizes heaven. They're ready for a spiritual battle with the forces of Satan. John then sees three angels who proclaim a message to those on earth. There are only two possible responses to the proclamations of these angels. Either repentance and faith in Jesus leading to salvation or continued rebellion and sin leading to judgment. The judgments associated with the first four bowls are similar to the judgments associated with the first four trumpets and the first four seals. But the judgments of the bowls are far more intense. While the seals affect one quarter of their targets and the trumpets affect one third, the bowls affect everything. The judgments connected to the seals, trumpets and bowls represent God's judgments which have been affecting the world throughout history and which will continue to do so until Jesus returns, progressively intensifying as that day grows closer. The judgments associated with the final three bowls describe the final and comprehensive judgment of everything and everyone that's opposed to God, which will take place at the end of time. The destruction of this present universe at Jesus' return will make way for the new heaven and earth. In Revelation 17, one of the angels involved in the bold judgments shows John a vision of the fall of Babylon, which expands upon the seventh bowl. Babylon is depicted as a prostitute and it symbolises this proud, idolatrous, sinful world with all the charms it uses to seduce people away from God to do whatever they feel like. Following the vision of the beast turning on Babylon, chapter 18 contains a lament for Babylon that echoes several Old Testament prophetic laments against pagan cities. However, the opening verses of chapter 19 reveal the saints praising God for the destruction of Babylon. In the second half of Revelation chapter 19, John sees heaven opened and Jesus pictured as a rider on a white horse coming to bring judgment on the beast and the false prophet. Revelation 20 describes a symbolic thousand year period during which Satan is bound and the saints reign with Christ. The thousand years most likely symbolises the entire period between Jesus' first coming and his return at the end of time. So the, the binding of Satan began during the earthly ministry of Christ and through his death, Christ destroyed Satan. This section of Revelation concludes with everyone who has ever lived appearing before God's throne to be judged. Those whose name isn't in the Lamb's Book of Life are thrown into the lake of fire, while those whose name is in it will live in the new heaven and earth, which is described briefly at the start of Revelation chapter 21. Following this, an angel gives John a detailed look at the new Jerusalem, which will come down out of heaven. The description of the city as a gigantic cube reminds us of the most holy place in the tabernacle and temple where God's presence was manifested. In this vision, we see God's original goal for creation fulfilled in the new creation as his kingdom is fully established on earth and his presence is fully experienced by his people. The curse, which was the result of sin, is removed and nothing unclean or evil will ever again harm God's creation 
or God's people. In Revelation's conclusion, John is told not to seal the words of this prophecy because the end is near. Jesus identifies himself as the divine Messiah and judge. And the readers of Revelation are urged to come to Jesus so they can drink from the water of life, which has been freely provided by what he accomplished through his life, death and resurrection. Mark Twain said, It's not the parts of the Bible I don't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand that bother me. As I said earlier, it takes effort to understand the book of Revelation. Even after preparing and preaching all the way through it, I freely admit there are some things I don't fully understand. But there is plenty that we can all understand. In Revelation, God promises his blessing seven times on those who hear and obey Revelation's message, who die in the Lord, who stay awake and alert, who attend the Lamb's marriage supper, who share in the first resurrection, and who wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb. God hasn't given us the book of Revelation either to provoke or satisfy our curiosity about his hidden timetable. Instead, he's provided revelation to arm his people for the spiritual conflict we face every day. So what lessons does God want us to take away from Revelation? First of all, Revelation helps us see our situation in its true perspective. Revelation helps us see our situation in its true perspective. We often gauge how the spiritual conflict is going by how the headlines about political decisions or global crises look to us. Revelation's visions remind us that we walk by faith, not by sight. For example, Christ's cross looked like the slaughter of a helpless lamb, but it was actually the triumph of Judah's lion. When faithful believers have been martyred, their enemies seem to have conquered. But in fact, the martyrs are the true victors who triumphed over Satan. By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Secondly, Revelation shows our enemy in his true colours. Revelation shows our enemy in his true colours. Our enemy, the great dragon, that ancient serpent, the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray, is stronger and more shrewd than we are. But the seed of the woman has come, conquered Satan and ascended to heaven. Satan can no longer accuse God's people because his charges have been silenced by Christ's sacrifice. Frustrated by his defeat at the cross, Satan vents his anger against the church on earth. His weapons are violent persecution, believable deception, and the seductive pleasure that this world offers. The state, false religion and pleasure may claim to be our saviors, but we shouldn't be fooled by them. Their true aim is to destroy us. Revelation removes the mask that hides the ugly emptiness of the counterfeits that Satan offers us. Thirdly, Revelation reveals our champion in his true glory. Revelation reveals our champion in his true glory. As the opening verse of the book states, what we've been studying is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation unveils Jesus and fixes our hearts and our hopes on him. He's the hero of every dramatic scene. He's the glorious son of man, foretold in Daniel chapter 7, who sees death keys by his resurrection and now walks 
among his churches. Jesus is the Lion of Judah, who conquered by being slain, thereby redeeming people from all the earth's nations. So he's worthy of worship from every creature everywhere. Jesus is the captain of heaven's armies, riding into battle against his and our enemies, defending struggling saints, and finally destroying the dragon and his beasts. Our champion encourages our weary hearts with his promise, I am coming soon. To which we should reply, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Fourthly, Revelation enables us to see ourselves in our true beauty. Revelation enables us to see ourselves in our true beauty. Jesus' message to the churches in Asia Minor demonstrate that his fiery eyes see us accurately. This means he can commend our faithfulness and show us our flaws. Although the church is presently imperfect, our bridegroom loves us and he won't rest until he presents us to himself as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband, clothed with fine linen, bright and clean. This should motivate us to pursue now the loveliness which will be fully ours when that happens. Fifthly, Revelation summons us to endure as we suffer. Revelation summons us to endure as we suffer. Revelation was originally addressed to Christians who were suffering for their faith. They experienced poverty, slander, prison and even death. Writhing in his death throes, in the aftermath of the cross, Satan will increase his attack on God's people until Jesus returns to put an end to him and put an end to history. Jesus doesn't promise his followers a painless escape from this war with Satan. Instead, he promises to be with us as the one who is alive forever and ever. In response to that promise, we must heed Jesus' call to patiently endure. Sixthly, Revelation calls us to stay pure when we're tempted to compromise. Revelation calls us to stay pure when we're tempted to compromise. Some of the first century churches, like many churches in the 21st century, faced a subtler threat than persecution. Satan, the father of lies, tried to mislead believers through false teachers. And the idolatry of the surrounding culture, with its associated immorality, was also a great temptation, as it is today. These dangerous attacks on wholehearted allegiance to Christ are still with us. Revelation calls us to rely on God's strength to resist Satan's lies and resist the invitations to idolize pleasure and prosperity so that we who are the Lamb's bride can keep our hearts and our lives pure. Lastly, Revelation encourages us to bear witness as we wait for Jesus to return. Revelation encourages us to bear witness as we wait for Jesus to return. In case we think that Revelation summons to endure and stay pure means that we're to withdraw from the dangerous and sinful world we live in, we need to hear Revelation's command to bear witness to the testimony of Jesus. John was on Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus when he wrote Revelation. In Revelation chapter 11, we saw the church symbolized by two witnesses who announce God's word and seal their testimony with their blood. Christ's witnesses aren't meant to be timidly silent. We're to boldly declare that Jesus is Lord of all 
even when this results in opposition, persecution, or death. Through our testimony, God is fulfilling John's vision in Revelation chapter 7 of a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb and they cried out in a loud voice Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. God has given us the book of Revelation not only to inform our minds but also to transform our lives. It gives us insight into the realities of our situation, our enemies, our champion and our true identity. And it calls us to patient endurance, hopeful purity and courageous witness. This afternoon I will post two short videos on our Facebook page which provide a fuller summary of what God teaches us through Revelation. I would strongly encourage you to watch those two videos. Let us pray now and let us ask God to help us remember what he has taught us through Revelation. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for every word in the Bible because we know every word in the Bible is your word. Therefore, it is important and it is helpful for us. Lord, we do thank you for being with us as we have studied this book of Revelation. Father, thank you for helping us to understand the strange pictures it contains. Thank you for helping us to see the connections to the Old Testament. But Lord, we thank you most of all that this understanding has helped us to see you better, to see what a great God you are, to see that wonderful plan of salvation that you had before you laid the foundation of the world and which you're working out perfectly in Jesus and which will come to a completion at his return. So Lord, as we continue to live in this world, we pray that you'd enable us to devote ourselves to studying your word so that we know you and your plan of salvation better. We also pray that you'd strengthen us to live for you so that we don't give in to the temptations to get involved in the idolatry and the immorality of this world. And you'd help us to endure whatever opposition we encounter as we live for you and as we share the good news of Jesus with others. Father, thank you that your word is living and active. And it is your word that transforms us and makes us more like Christ. So help us to immerse ourselves in it so that we grow to be more like our Saviour, who we will see one day face to face. We ask all of this in his lovely name. Amen. Our closing hymn is Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. God calls us to live for him and to declare the good news about Jesus. We can't do either of those things in our own strength, and God doesn't intend us to. Instead, he wants us to rely on Christ, who lives in us, in the person of the Holy Spirit. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus For my life is whole strange and divine I can sing all is mine yet not I but through Christ in me the night is dark but I am not forsaken for by my 
inside the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hope my shepherd will defend me. It has been paid For Jesus bled And suffered for my pardon And He was raised To overthrow the grave To this I hold My sin has been defeated Jesus now and ever is my plea chains are released I can sing I am free yet not I but through Christ in me with every breath I long to follow Jesus for he has said that he will bring me home and day by day, I know He will renew me Until I stand with joy before the throne To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus All the glory evermore to Him When the race is complete Through Christ in me.